We're going to open, and this will be a celebration of the resurrection, both in scripture, comment, and song. And we're going to open with the singing of Kim entitled Christ's Resurrection. And you can sing along if you would like. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, we read, according to New International, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on, on which you have your, taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached you, otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, the Apostle Paul here is setting up a basic premise. He's using deductive reasoning. He's saying, you know, if you believe in the gospel that I preached you, that's your stand. And if you believe otherwise, you're believing in vain. And he goes on in subsequent verses to prove this case very eloquently. Continuing. Well, what have I... For what... I received, I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so the Apostle Paul right now is, is really crafting a very interesting story and a very true story. He's crafting a story where he says, well, Christ died. He died for our sins. He's introducing this threat as well, and that he was raised on the third day. So right here in the very beginning of this book, he establishes his premise of the resurrection. And oh, by the way, it's a premise that we all see and understand. They had witnessed his resurrection. A number of them had witnessed it. And so he's laying forth the foundation uh, of his further discourse on this subject. And then he appeared on the Cephas and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to 500 more of brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some may have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared 
to me also as one abnormally born. And so the apostle here is establishing the fact that, you know, for up until Pentecost, Christ appeared to uh, about over 500 individuals and all of the apostles as well. This was to establish the fact that he had been resurrected. You know, this is not like a clone or a robot where you brought the robot back, but it didn't have any of the memories. They recognized Jesus. They spoke with Jesus. Some of them even, Thomas even touched him. And so what happened here was it was a very convincing and cohesive case that the resurrection had occurred. We're now going to join in singing, My Redeemer Lives. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 15, we read, 
for I am the least of the apostles and do not even desire to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. This scripture really shows the amazing grace that was present in the Apostle Paul's life. He was least of all the apostles, and yet he was so significant in, what, in the New Testament and what they left behind. Let us go ahead and we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Continuing we read, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And so here the Apostle Paul provides very compelling evidence, and he's expanding this. Everyone knew that Christ had been raised, but he's, he's expanding it to show that all will have an opportunity for a resurrection. He's laying seeds here for his 
further discourse. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The Apostle Paul here really lays forth a beautiful formula about the first Adam and the last Adam. This is all about the ransom and the corresponding price. As in Adam die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Dear brethren, this reminds me of a very same famous uh, music from Handel's Messiah. It's the 46th chorus. We'll go ahead and uh, show that on the screen. But in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when, the, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now our lesson on the resurrection takes a whole new turn. It really delves into God's plan and his purposes in this integral part of his plan, the resurrection. So it shows that this is part of a much bigger plan when God will eliminate even death and then all will have an opportunity for life. Wow, what a wonderful plan. When he has done this, then the son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all 
and all. And now you'll note, so he's, he's framed God's plan from the beginning to the end. And now he goes back to his premise on the resurrection. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. So here the apostle Paul really nails home the argument. If, if there's no resurrection, why am I endangering my life? Why am I facing death and if so my hopes are really in vain if the dead are not raised and yet we know that the dead are raised you know this reminds us of our need in every hour being instant in prayer to the heavenly father we need him every hour. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 15, we read, But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be just a seed, perhaps a wheat or something else. And so 
a natural question is, how will the body come back? And what he's saying is, you're planting a seed and it will come back anew. Continuing, but God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds, another. And fish, another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differeth from star in splendor. So here in this resurrection chapter, we have introduced the concept of the two salvations, a heavenly calling with a heavenly reward and an earthly reward for the vast majority of mankind. And so the Apostle Paul is laying these facts out. Now, the Apostle Paul's audience in chapter 15 has been his footstep followers very clearly. It was addressed to those that had witnessed or uh, once removed had talked to those that had witnessed Jesus's resurrection appearances. And so these were believers. These were spirit begotten children of God. And the Apostle Paul here is very delicately uh, laying out God's plan that there's a heavenly reward and an earthly reward. And he's doing it through this lesson of the resurrection. We'll now sing a song called The Resurrection Morn. Once more, many 
Continuing in 1 Corinthians 15, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown, that sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And so here we have the contrast of those of the high calling. They will be raised imperishable. They will be raised in glory. They will be raised in power. They will be raised in a spiritual body. And so the Apostle Paul uses this discourse on resurrection to illustrate yet another part of God's plan. And his footstep followers are those who would understand this language. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Of course, it's speaking of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. And if we go back to the Genesis account, we see that man was made from the dust of the earth. And so the analogy continues, and it shows that the first is earthly and the second is spiritual. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. What a powerful message. The promise of the resurrection. And not just any resurrection but of a heavenly resurrection, of a spiritual nature. This is lost on the world of mankind as they read these verses. But we see the two salvations and their integral part of God's plan being illustrated in the discourse that the Apostle Paul is giving. We're now going to sing All Hail.
Continuing in 1 Corinthians 15, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Here the Apostle Paul is showing that a transformation takes place from mortal to immoral, mortal, from perishable to imperishable. And he's showing the transition that must take place when he says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. A very powerful lesson. And he helps set up the expectation for the church. That expectation is one of a heavenly reward. When the imperishable has been clothed with, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here the Apostle Paul really lays out very clearly for each and every one that we have victory through Jesus. And so join us in singing Sweet Victory in Jesus. life on Calvary to pardon you and me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I committed all to him and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and bought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and
continuing in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul kind of sums it up. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain because the resurrection is not in vain. And this critical part of God's plan that gives all who have ever lived an opportunity for life is true. Jesus's resurrection was God's sign of approval that his sacrifice was acceptable and accepted. And as a result, it opened a new and living way so that all might have an opportunity to come back to a newness of life. The power of the resurrection is a key element of the faith once delivered to the saints. And as such, it's to be understood by those footstep followers, but not by the world. It shows God's acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And his appearances proved that it works. And that proof then gives us a surety that there will be a resurrection of all. It opened up a new and living way, first an opportunity for the footstep followers and then for the world of mankind. And it demonstrates that death will be overcome and provides the only hope, the only hope for all of mankind. God has a plan and everyone is in it. And the power of the resurrection is a key element of that plan. Praise be to God.